First of all, can everyone see and hear me? Uh, if anyone could chuck a thumbs up in the chat, if you can, that would be great. We'll get started shortly. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, well, kia ora, uh, nā mihi nui, kia koutou katoa. I uh, want to extend a really warm welcome to our kids and investing webinar. I'm Susanna and ShareZ is a wealth development platform and our purpose is to create financial empowerment for everyone and that includes the little ones. Tonight, I am really excited about our chat on ShareZ's kids accounts. Uh, followed by a discussion with our panel of experts, uh, some fantastic wahini. And we'll also leave enough time at the end to answer any questions that you have. You can submit your questions through the ask a question uh, button below. Uh, don't leave questions in the discussion area as they're likely to get missed. Before we get started, uh, here is some important information. Investing involves risk. You might lose uh, the money you start with. We recommend talking to a licensed financial advisor we also recommend reading product disclosure documents before deciding to invest. Everything you're about to see and hear is current at the time of this recording. And finally, please be kind and respectful towards our panelists and your fellow viewers. Otherwise, we will take steps to remove you from the webinar. Before we meet our panelists, uh, some info about ShareZ's Kids <coughs> Accounts. We launched Kids Accounts back in 2018, and since then, over 39,000 Kids Accounts have been created on Sharesies. Kids Accounts enable adults to invest on behalf of anyone aged 18 or under. You don't need to be a parent or caregiver to create or contribute to a Kids Account. A Kids Account can be for any kid in your life. You will need some info about them, including their ID, residential address, and IID number, and we'll share some handy links in the chat. If you're interested in creating a kids account, we'll have a special promotion running at the moment. If you use the promo code KIDS22, oh, KIDS22 when you sign up for a kids account, they'll get $10 added to their wallet to get started. So now onto our panel. I'm joined by Ruth Henderson, Alicia Rutherford and Francis Cook to have a quarter about how to get started investing for kids, why it's a good idea and important things to know along the way. I'm going to hand it over to our panelists so that they can tell you a little bit more about themselves. So firstly, to Ruth. Uh, Ruth, you've recently written some articles for the ShareSys website about investing for kids. Mm -hmm. We'll share this chat. But at a high level, why is it so important to start investing for kids? I think it's just while well, your children are at home with you, you're the best person to teach them. And it's just knowledge that you can impart day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, and just build on that knowledge. Like investing is not a one and done. You're not going to have a chat with them at 18 and they're like, yep, got it, I'm on with it. So with my daughter who's 14, it's just every every week, every day, we've had an opportunity to kōrero about money. And um, in the last couple of years, that's certainly come around to investing. So it's just an ongoing process until she leaves home at 18, basically, and I hope she remembers it all. <laughs> And Ruth, could you tell us a little more about your background? So I started um, a blog about six years ago now called The Happy Saver, and I did it just out of um, out of passion for investing but knowing not much about it, and I was struggling to answer some questions around money and I was finding that information. And my husband kept saying to me that I should start a blog, and um, I eventually did. So now I blog. Can you hear me okay? That noise... Yep. So now I just blog uh, regularly and I've got a big community online that I converse with about anything money related. So, yeah, I'm here to help people if they ever need help, basically. Oh, cool. And um, to Alicia and Ruth, and maybe um, let's start with Alicia. Uh, could you tell us a bit about your own journey investing for your kids and why you did start investing for them? Yeah, sure. Um, so... I think we decided um, shortly after Max was born when we were kind of encouraged by family members that it was time to go and like open up a bank account and do all of these kind of things for a small person you bring into the world. Um, and we we decided then that we were going to um, actually set up um, 
like kids accounts and uh, kids investing accounts instead and um we had been having a play with sharesies around the same time and so the timing just worked out perfectly um that actually we realized sharesies had an opportunity for kids to be investing and so we made the decision to um set up both of our kids when they were born a um, Shizu's account and we've only put money into that for them um, and so yeah it's been great because I mean kids get like a one-year-old gets like birthday money like it's, it's a different world to when I I was a small child um, and so yeah my, my kids have had birthday money from grandparents and family members and all sorts Christmas money Easter money, um, all sorts of reasons to give kids money uh, from family members. And so we've been popping that directly into their um, Chessies account, which has been awesome for us um, to kind of see um, mostly grow, not in the last couple of months, but mostly. <laughs> yeah, cool. And, um, and Ruth, similarly, um, can you tell us a bit about your own journey uh, through investing with your child or it sounds like teenager now um, and yeah. why you did it? For yeah. them. We started at birth. <laughs> um, we knew she's going to cost us money somewhere down the track so that uh, we would soften the blow basically. So we did sign her up for KiwiSaver when she was first born and have just drip fed money into that just a very small amount ever since and that just gently builds up, meaning that when she gets to 65 it's just she's just going to unlock extra money basically. Then we set up um, just bank accounts for her to cover expenses that we knew would come up like car seats and, and just stuff like that. And then um, I did set her up with another investment company with an ETF and have also put money into that probably about seven years. And then that's um, quite a cumbersome platform to use. So when Sharesies did come along, it was like, right, we're all in on this. And so then we started with them. And from day one, even though um, that was probably – must be about four years ago we did that. So even though from day one she didn't get it, she didn't understand it, but I just said, hey, come, I'll show you what I've done. I've set this up, and shares these is quite interesting for kids with their nice bright colours and all that sort of stuff. And I said, this is what we're doing. When you get your pocket money and your Christmas money and your – didn't get Easter money, but birthday money and the likes of that um, – 50% of everything she earns is invested and that's where it goes. And then as time went on and she did get her own bank account, the likes of that, it was teaching her how to do a transfer into her Shizzy's account and then to go on and invest it and that sort of thing. So it's just been just bit by bit we've added to her money set up and it's just gently grown over time. And she still doesn't understand all the ins and outs of it, but she just does it because her kind of mum says to do it. And then I, I just openly discuss with her all the time about where her money is and what it's doing and, and the reasons why we've got money set aside for different things, you know, like university one day, first house one day and that sort of thing. So it's, it's, a, it's a gentle process of lots of little conversations to, to build it up and, and she can see that it's, um, you know, when she sees the numbers, numbers don't lie, she can see that. She knows what she's put in and she knows what it's grown to. So that's quite rewarding to see that. Yeah, totally. And uh, Francis, um, you know, what about you? Really keen to hear how you're thinking about uh, starting that investing journey for your little one as well. Yes, yes. Well, I'm certainly the newest parent in the mix. Mine is nine months old and just down to sleep. Um, so, yeah, it's it's one of those that we've been thinking about since we knew we wanted to have a kid. and. Um, we just knew that something like shares, when you've got time up your sleeve, you know, you need a lot less money. And mm. I think that's the great gift when you have kids is that everyone I ever talk to about investing says, I wish I could have started earlier. And then when you have kids, you suddenly have this huge runway where you can start earlier and you have 20 bucks that is really powerful over 20 years, you know. So that was something that we knew we just wanted to start from day dot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I mean, I started my investing journey at university, but, you know, I wish I'd started earlier. I mean, it really is that time in the market. So yeah, <laughs> great to be able to provide that for, um, for our kids. And Alicia, you're the Deputy Mayor of Palmerston North and you also talk about money on your Instagram. What kind of impact does investing for kids and getting kids involved with money have on a wider community? 
Um, I mean, I think in an immediate sense, certainly for like our kids and the people around us involved in our kids' lives as well, I think it just shows them opportunity um, because I guess certainly when I was growing up, it was just about um, a bank account. And I think the kind of the riskiest sort of um, investment my parents would have done was bonus bonds. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like, um, you know, or, or, or rental properties, which, um, you know, were a relatively conservative investment. Um, and so I think, I think it shows them opportunity. Um, you know, the, the concept of compound interest is one that is not well known and it's not um i don't think it's commonly understood and you know and i know there's a question coming about it so i won't talk about it but in terms of like you know it being free money i think the opportunity for that to sort of see how how it can grow so i think i think yeah first and foremost i think talking about investing talking about investing with kids actually provides opportunity and um you know Francis was talking around this time that people people always wish that they had, especially when it comes to investing. We have that with our kids. Mm -hmm. And so if we create those opportunities now, then then there is, you know, either opportunity possibly to learn, depending on what they invest in, or or opportunities for success and growth. And so I think that that's a really cool thing. Um, and also just to normalize how we spend our money. Like we should just talk about money and um, you know it is a it is a tea room kind of conversation it's a lunch break conversation it's an Instagram conversation it's a whatever conversation and so I just think the more we talk about it in any way we, whether we use the vehicle of investing with kids or whether we just talk about how we you know spend our money um, is a really important kind of shift that we need to to have within society um, because it, it removes barriers for people to engage in the subject, um, whatever your income level is. Um, and so I think, you know, traditionally it's been something for wealthy people, but actually investing creates wealth. So everyone should have access to it. Yeah, such a good point. Um, and Ruth, uh, you have all sorts of conversations with the readers of your blog. Uh, is what Alicia said similar to what you've heard from them as well? Absolutely. And it probably comes through more so on my podcast. There wouldn't be a person I speak to who doesn't say, oh, I wish I knew about this when I was younger. I wish I had more time. And everybody kicks themselves when they're 30, 40, 50, 60 years old and they finally work out how the share market works and, and, and the, you know, the companies that they're investing in because, you know, it's not just buying a unit. It's like, well, you're taking a part in a company and they get interested and they're like, and that sort of thing. So, and that's why I'm so delighted to have a daughter. It's like I think of her as my social experiment. Like I didn't learn about this until I was in my 30s. But I know I know what works now. And it's like, why wouldn't I help her get started with that and teach her? You know, she will make mistakes along the way, I'm sure. But um, but she's she's got a she's got so much more knowledge than any of us in this room had when we were born sort of thing. So and that's why I always blog quite a lot about what she's up to so that other people can pull from that what they will and if they want to use it in their own home with their own children well that's if it works for them that's wonderful too so I'm the same as you Alicia it's just just talk about money what's the big deal what's the big deal and so at home from always it's always been it's like this is what I earn this week this is what we spent on rates this is what um you know the blog earned us this whatever it might be we just talk about that and then kids it normalizes it and also when they're given like $50, they, they feel the value of that money um, instead of it's just this random note or it's this these numbers that turn up in your bank account. So it's just so, so valuable to just talk about it. It's like, cheer what you earn. Who cares? <laughs> yeah. And uh, Francis, you're the investments editor at Business Desk. Uh, so you're used to talking and writing about money. Uh, but for those who aren't as familiar and um, you know, Alicia, you touched on this earlier. One of the reasons why it is so important to start investing early and get that runway is around compound returns. So could you explain what this is and why it is so important? Yeah, so I think the big thing with compounding is just to start with knowing that our brains are not built for understanding compound interest. So I kind of think of it often like, like I'll tell you how it works, but it's also a bit like, what you need to know mostly is that it works. You know, the same way I turn a light switch on in my home, 
I'm not entirely sure how electricity works, but I know the light turns on and I know it will every time unless I haven't turned the light bulb or something. Um, you know, so I think that's the big thing is to know that your brain's going to struggle with it a bit. That's just how it goes. But you can look up compound interest calculators that really help you figure it all out. And you can suddenly see really powerfully that, you know, you put in a little bit of money that starts earning money. The money you've earned is earning money. You've got profits making profits. And it's it's like a, a little rolling money snowball that starts out really small, but it packs onto itself and gets so much bigger out of all proportion. And, you know, if you if you do something like you put in 20 bucks a week for your kid, which doesn't seem very much, right? And then you've got 20 years-ish before you probably hand that money over to them. Let's say it's a 7% interest rate. Um, now, the New Zealand share market has actually earned about 10% roughly over the year, each year, averaged out. But if you take off, you know, fees, taxes, inflation, then we can say 7%-ish. It's conservative, but we like to stay conservative. Then that means that you have about $40,000 for your kid by the time they're 20, just off that $20 a week. And you only put in 19,000 of that. So it's more than double off $20 a week. And that's just, you know, it's gone along, it's earned its profits, it's done its thing, it's just hung out in the market, no fancy tricks, no trading, no nothing. That's just a bog standard investment. And that's incredible to be able to give them that gift as they head off into adulthood of this nest egg of maybe they want to start a business, maybe they want to go traveling, maybe they want to well, that's probably not a house deposit anymore, but it's a start. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's an incredible gift that could really get them started towards some goals in life of 20 bucks a week. That's amazing to me. It's mm -hmm. it's magical. Yeah, I really resonate with that comment around our brains not being that wide to sort of cope with the compound returns. Um, I've often seen the compound return and then just not believed it and get out the calculator and check and sure enough that <laughs> that yeah. does work the math does add up but um it is often just you know the, the power of compounding is is quite remarkable and often does seem unbelievable but mm. the math does back up <laughs> and can i just comment on that in regards to my daughter's sharesies and like initially when she thought i was robbing her by making her put half her money in there then when she started to see that compounding and she started to see because it says you know you've put in this much and these are your returns and then that number started to build and then she got out the calculator and she she gets her pocket money each week and she worked out that her returns equated to it was something like 42 weeks of pocket money and so i loved it how she put that into her own terms and so she's like Ah, so I don't have to make my bed and empty the dishwasher this week and something well, you still do. But um but yeah, so she started by letting her take part in that, um, it really hammered at home. It's that's how compounding works. Yeah. And I love your analogy, you don't need to know how it works, it just does. So yeah. Mm. Such great context as well, and the context of mm. yeah, pot of money and how many weeks yeah. you need to do yeah. for. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we've covered the why and now on to the how. So back to you, Francis. If you want to start investing for a kid in your life, where do you start and what are some of the things to, to really think about uh, before you get started? So I think obviously this is all going to be very general because we're all very different. But in general terms, I think anyone who's getting started, um, when you're getting into shares, the big things to remember are they are a long-term investment. It's for money that you shouldn't be looking to use in the next five to 10 years. Um, and that's, you know, a really important part. It's also something that you want to, you know, we always talk about diversification, which just means don't put all your eggs in one basket. You don't really want to be in just one company or even just one um, sector, like even just tech stocks or just one country like New Zealand, you know. And so you want to make sure you're spreading your money around because, any one business can be hit by a dose of bad luck. It's just what happens. There have been companies um, that I have been covering in my work that looked like they were doing great and they just out of nowhere keeled over. Now, that doesn't mean that shares in general are a big gamble. It just means that bad things can happen and it's a bit of a surprise. And if you're investing into 50 or 100 or a few thousand companies, then it's okay. You've factored in the bad luck and you are prepared for it. I think that's a big thing is 
you don't stick your head in the sand, you just plan for it. Um, and so I think for all of those things, for, for making sure it's long term, for making sure that you are investing into more than one thing, I always think the best place for most people to begin investing is things like index funds and ETFs, because then you are into many different um, companies and often different countries all at once. It's super easy. Um, I always think people should look for a nice low fee as well. Um, and then it's just stick your money in and forget about it. Um, and that means you don't overcomplicate it. We have, all have different things to do with our Saturday morning, probably go and watch the kids play sport. Um, you don't want to be thinking too much about your investments. And the best investments are often the boring ones. Stick it in, forget about it, move on with your day. That's, I think, the best way for beginners or even experienced investors. I just think it's the best way to invest. Yeah, those ETFs and managed funds just provide that instant diversification, which, yeah, such a great place to start, but also keep going, you know, as, as you say, for all investors. Um, Alicia, Ruth, do you have anything else that you might want to add to that? Everything Francis just said, for sure. And also, because when if you start them young enough, they've got no idea what you're doing anyway. So if you can get them a nice broad fund and just leave it be, and then one day when they start to take an interest in it, like my daughter from time to time has said, oh, you know, she doesn't want to buy individual companies and things, but from time to time she's mentioned them as if she, she might. And I say, oh, you already own it. It's already in the fund. I'll show you where it is. And, I, and that's when I go, I log into the relevant place and I pull it all up and I show her, well, there you go, there's that company that you talked about. So it's like you've actually been investing in it all these years. So she's like, hmm, interesting. Yeah. But I, just, I yeah, think the only... Yeah. Sorry, Alicia. Sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say, I think the only other thing I would add is um, just to do like a quick Google of um, of the fund or of the ETF or whatever you're, whatever you're looking at, just to see... Um, you know, if it does align with kind of your values or what's important to you, because I mean, I know um, I certainly didn't spend a heck of a lot of time at all choosing what um, what we were investing in for our kids, but we did kind of make sort of broad decisions, you know, looking at, so for us, things like carbon funds or um, global automation, you know, so, because those were things that actually we thought would be quite important to them in terms of the generation that they're, they're born into. Um, and also, you know, maybe some of the things we wanted to be a part of with like issues to solve and stuff around climate action. So th those were things that were important to us. I think um, I think that is worth considering because I, I absolutely agree it's a long-term game. It's kind of like, you know, you're washing in the lounge, like you put it there and you leave it and you pretend it doesn't exist. Um, and so, you know, nobody <laughs> actually folds it and puts it away for ages. Um, and so, I, yeah, it, it is one of those things where you don't really want to be like constantly checking in on. And so you kind of want to have a little bit of um, confidence in the the general area of where you're investing and so I think that um yeah that that's something that is important um we've we've had friends who've kind of just gone and chucked their money anywhere and then for them they've found out that they were investing in um things that were not quite aligned with their values and had to make that for them they made swift exits which also meant that they had some losses that came with that so I just think yeah do a quick google search you don't have to go in and read people's annual reports and check the company directors and all of that if if, if you don't have time for that but but you can kind of google and especially hitting the news function on google will bring up any news reports of um of funds if there are really so just a just a five minute due diligence i also think as well just to jump in on that point um the mindful money website is a brilliant one that makes it really easy to check different funds they have lots and lots on there not every single one in existence but they do have lots on there and they break down what sort of things they're invested into you can rank it by your particular concerns um for your own ethical investing because of course everyone's ethics are different um and so i see that shares is very helpfully dropped the link there so that is yeah you can just check out the mindful money website um and it is a, a classic easy way of checking if something aligns with your values And uh, it's one thing to invest for kids, uh, but another to get them involved and really understand what's going on. Um, and we've touched on that a little bit. But, you know, what other tips and tricks would you give adults who are investing for kids and want to get them involved too, based on your own experiences? Um, maybe we'll start with Alicia. 
Yeah, so um, so my kids are three and nearly five, so they're very young, and we talk about money in very, very simple terms. Um, they know that they they think they own some robots out, out there somewhere. That's kind of like, you know, what, what they think in terms of their, like the robotics and automation fund that they've, um, they're investing into. And so we speak about it in very like age appropriate ways and, um, and talk about like, um, you know, digital advancement and, and innovation and those sorts of things. Like somebody's making new robots. Um, but, but we, we sort of, yeah, we talk about that. So, so they know that they're investing, but it's in, it's in ways that are, is very age appropriate. Um, I guess we we talk about money a lot in our house and we talk about, you know, what we use money for. And so, you know, it's not uncommon for my kids to ask me in the weekend if we have donut money this weekend or if we have, you know, movie money this weekend or whatever it is. So so we talk about money being used for different things and they know that um, some of it is invested. Um, I think I, I imagine that, Ruth might have an easier job of talking about investing um, with a teenager. But um, yeah, so we certainly talk about it. And, and actually, because we talk about our money every week, we do, we do this thing called Fin Chat, where every um, Sunday we, we sit down for half an hour and go through all of our money spending for the week, what's coming up, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and every quarter we have a look at our investments. My husband actually looks every single week, but I don't I don't care. Um, and so so we talk about it quarterly, but we talk about it with our kids. Our kids are often sitting there while we're having these conversations. Um, and so yeah, we just we just try to make it a, a part of our normal conversation in our family. It's amazing what kids absorb as well, you know, just listening in the background, all of those conversations. Um, Ruth, um, Francis, do you have anything else to add? You go for it just, first, Ruth. Thank you. Just what you're saying there, like we talk about money a lot as well and it's just calm, measured, you know, have you fed the dog today, right, have you done your shares? You know, it's it's just a part of everyday conversation and, um, and letting her be aware that there are the, you know, she's building up these pockets of money for, for a variety of things, for the short-term things, for the medium term things like university or something like that and then for those longer term things and what I'm building up to now is um is she I want her to take over so the money that we put in now because 14 year olds don't don't earn that much she will start to take that over so I'm fully prepping into those conversations now that she knows that I'll put um you know $40 into an index fund for her or whatever and give it time I'm going to get to keep my $40. She'll be putting her own money in there. And so because she's been part of those conversations the whole way along, it's, it will just be this natural progression for her. And also just showing her um, how far money can go if you just mind it well and, and really encouraging her to do that. And it was last year she wanted a phone because, of course, you always got to have a phone. But she went and researched it. She worked out what it was going to cost. And, uh, and then she had to find the money to do it. Because she has to um, invest 50% of everything she earns, she had to earn even more money and that sort of thing. And then she she amazed herself at how far she achieved her goal. And I think that just comes down to she saw opportunities to earn. She knew what she needed. She knew she was going to put the money. And then she wrote herself a lovely chart, stuck it on the fridge, and boom, she achieved it. So it's just normalising it, normalising it. And seeing um, my husband and I just talk with our own money planning the things that we do as a family together and as individuals and that sort of thing so it's just everyday speak is is absolutely the key have your own money under control and then they can see that yeah i totally agree with that that you just to make it a normal part of the family discussion um you know obviously money isn't everything but it is a huge part of what gives you options in life and a huge part of how you make things happen in life so there's all sorts of areas where you could just be going about daily life and money comes up and you know we my husband and I have got to a point where we just talk about money really openly and really honestly with each other and we have just kept going um as bubs is now hanging out with us um and we do also we uh, every month beginning of every month we go through and we do a net worth update and we do things like how much is the mortgage and how much is the house supposedly worth now and what are our investments at what are our kiwi savers at and we check all that stuff out and we add it all up see what the net worth is at at the moment um 
pillow talk in our house is really riveting but you know <laughs> it's quite fun seeing where yeah. it's at especially currently um things like the house price is going nuts and the share markets all over the place it's quite funny seeing month on month even as you just carry on with your normal investing plan how much it can fluctuate as the market moves around it's quite fun um and so, you know, now we have uh, Bub come into bed with us in the morning and hang out with us as we're starting the day. And he's there while we're doing a monthly net worth update. And, you know, that's just part of, you know, he's gnawing on a toy or whatever. And that's just part of the background of his life. And I'm really hopeful that we will keep that going. That's certainly the plan for it to be just a normal part of conversation. If he has a question, he can never ask us about it, that he won't see it as weird, that he won't sort of feel that sort of money silence that I always think is quite harmful. And hopefully just by osmosis, it just goes in. Fingers crossed. <laughs> um, and Ruth, as a mum myself of a four-year-old and an 18-month-old, um, I'm really interested in how these money conversations have changed as your daughter has gotten older. Well, it's just, I think you all said, so age-specific specific as to where she's at. And um, and so, and they still remain that way. And it's like, she's still not that interested in money, but she's in, she knows she needs it. But it's like I read the J.L. Collins' A Simple Path to Wealth book, hands down the best book, and he said he wrote that for his daughter, who she wasn't interested in money, but she knew she, – she knows it plays a really important part in life and she needs to learn that. But she didn't need – you know, all of us in this room here, we're all really passionate about it. This I, I could talk all day long about it. That's not for her, but it doesn't mean that she doesn't understand the importance of it. So – um, so just age appropriate conversations and, and just backing off as well. Like sometimes she's like, oh, mom, here comes the money stuff again. And so I'll, I'll just back off and, and leave her. And, um, and if she has a question, she'll always come to me. Um, but it's, it's um, your wee baby, nine months old now, I can tell you we were exactly the same. And it has just become a part of the conversation at the dinner table and you know the start of every month do the net worth update and now I actually I've always tracked hers as well because I'm a nerd like that and who so now I tell her on the first of the month do you want to come see your net worth and it's like okay these are the different things you've got this is what they're all doing and it's like look compare it to last month compare it to last year so she's kind of like oh, I'm not looking but she is looking so um they just they take it all in they take it all in and so I've done, I've written blog posts for, um, you know, one day if she goes off to university or starts a business or something like that, I've I've written about how she's preparing for that right now um, because I don't want her to get to 19 or 18 and go, right, mum, I, I need a degree. It's, a, you know, I went to university, the chances are she possibly will, probably will. It's not expected that she will. But, hey, if she does, she's got that money there, and that's where Sharesies comes into it. That's where her university money is sitting. So I'm able to say to her, look, a paper at university costs this or a hall of residence costs that. You know, you've got your first year covered now. So that's kind of when you want to put it into everyday terms. That's what you've managed to achieve so far. So the conversations, they just grow as as the child grows and if, if ever she wants to talk about it she knows I'm there <laughs> otherwise I'll just otherwise I just talk at her yeah <laughs> yeah she's doing really well though she's doing really well it's awesome so good um so now for some quick uh fire questions from people watching tonight so the first one's from Kaylee uh and that is what can we do to ensure our kids don't blow through the money saved for them Obviously, educating them about money will help, but it is hard to make good decisions in your early 20s, uh, even if you have the knowledge. Um, and given, Ruth, that you're closest maybe to that point, <laughs> let's start yeah. with you. The, to me, that's pretty easy. Um, because, she, because she invests half of everything she earns, it's her money. And so she gets to see it incrementally um, grow. And so by the time she gets to uh, 18, when she'll take access I, th I think that's when I said it well she'll get access to her shares his money the chances of her going and blowing the lot I think is zero because she's had such ownership in growing that money and so that's what I'd say to people I do hear people say you know I'm setting this money aside for my tamariki but I'm not telling them about it I'm going to tell them when they're 18 and I just think that's the wrong approach because if you and I won lotto tomorrow you know the temptation's there it's like I didn't have that money before maybe I would 
go and blow it and it, and it would feel it would feel like a windfall if somebody suddenly gave you money so i just think involve them in the conversation use their money to grow their money and they'll take ownership of it yeah so true um and alicia and francis do you have anything else to add to that um i think for me i i probably um, I, I think you should be really honest about your, you know, both your money wins and your money losses. And actually, I think being having a really open money journey, money story with your family, um, you know, your kids, all of that, I think they can, there's opportunities for them to learn from both your successes and, and you know, not failures, but maybe you might have done differently. Or the risks you took, actually. And things like, you know, if they withdraw that money. So, you know, you money, letting them ship over that, but also showing them what the room if they in there and they're doing basic calculations of you know, the twenty years of seven and what that money could into if it was looking at right now. And I think it's also that important to be able to learn from the other experiences as probably is going to be time that might blow because as long as they know it's Sorry, Alexa, it's breaking up. So could you refresh your browser and let's just see if that, that works? Sure. Thank you. Actually, that can you speak now? Francis, do you want to um, add anything to that? Jeff, we were waiting for Alicia to rejoin us. Yeah, sure, sure. I just want to like add to Ruth's point. I think um, giving your kids ownership of it and letting them see it build up is a really smart idea um, because there is a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of information out there about you know when people get an inheritance or a lotto win, um, and then usually within five years or so they're actually worse off than they were before. And if you think about it, if this money suddenly turned up, then yeah, you probably don't feel much ownership over it. And you do think, oh, what treats can I spend this on? And you're not thinking of it as being your money. So I, I really agree with that approach of giving them ownership of it, letting them see it. And also when it's money that your kid has earned themselves, they don't want to then waste it. Um, I would say that there's probably um, the flip side is you probably can't stop them making a dumb decision. Um, and to a certain extent, um, you probably don't want to stop them making a dumb decision. There's a certain amount of, you know, if you start a business, most businesses fail, but the ones that don't are a great way to boost your wealth and probably have a really fulfilling career, hopefully. Um, you know, so there's a possibility that your kid will get access to this nest egg and say, I'm going to start this business and I'm a genius. And you look at the business idea and go, are you a genius? <laughs> like, I don't know. Is this? And maybe you're old and out of touch and it, they are a genius. And maybe you were actually right and it's a terrible business idea and the whole thing freaking fails. Well, hmm. is that a waste of money? I don't know. It's it's more, I like to call such things a non-fatal learning experience. Hopefully <laughs> non-fatal. Um, you know, and I just think if I, when I graduated university, didn't have anything. I started from scratch. Um, my family had all the love in the world, but it wasn't like they were showering with me with money. Um, and I built from scratch and it was fine. So if you give your kid this amazing leg up in life and they blow it and then they have to start from scratch, well, I think the best you can hope is that they learn something from it. And I really do think that even terrible decisions you can learn something from. So maybe they'll build something even better from scratch than they would have if they hadn't had that terrible learning experience. So I think there's, there's sort of the two sides. You're gonna try to set them up so that they don't blow it. And then if they do blow it, Maybe they'll learn something so they can do something even better. You hope. Fingers <laughs> crossed. <laughs> oh, and before we move to the next question, Alicia, can we quickly check your audio? Can you say something for me? Yeah, I don't have my, I think my earpods died on me partway through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that all sounds good. So let's crack on. 
Um, so the uh, next question is around KiwiSaver versus Sharesies. And Alicia, we touched on this just before this webinar, actually. So really keen to start with you on this one. Yeah, um, so we don't do KiwiSaver for our kids. Um, I think it would be different if there was the government Kickstarter. Um, there would be maybe more of an incentive. And so we're kind of probably just waiting for that to come back. Um, but in the meantime, we see um, Sharesies as a better opportunity because of, um, I think, giving the choice over accessing money um, when you choose to, essentially. Um, so in our whānau, we're not making the assumption that our kids will want to own their own home at some point. Um, and we also, we personally, we've been working towards financial freedom for the last, um, maybe the last sort of seven years seriously. If we had to wait until we were 65 to access our KiwiSaver, like, no, that's too far away. And so we don't want to place those kind of limitations on our kids. You know, um, I think every parent wants their kids to be more successful than them and, you know, have better opportunities. And so, I mean, if I'm going to retire in my 30s, maybe my kids might want to retire in their 20s. Um, <laughs> and KiwiSaver wouldn't allow them to do that. So we've, we've chosen to go down the path of prioritising um, sharesies. And at this stage, we haven't, haven't got KiwiSaver for our kids. Yeah, cool. And um, Ruth, Francis, uh, anything to add on that one? So I, I'm different. Um, I, I was saying earlier, I, the first trip out of my house was to sign my daughter up for KiwiSaver when you had to post it. It wasn't online. And I just thought, and, and, and that's what I thought. For the small amount I have to put in it each month, I just put $40 a month in. And yes, she did get the $1,000 kickstart, but I think even if it wasn't there, I still would have done it. And it's just, an, it's just another add-on. And so it will build over time. And one day when she gets a job and she's a PAY employee or she's putting into it voluntarily, it just will still add to it. And when she gets to 65, she'll be hopefully financially stable a long, long time before that. And it will just be such a nice wee gift to crack open, you know, at the age of 65. So I just see it as, as in addition to the other investments that she has going so and like I say she's got short medium and long term goals and and so that's a, that's a long play that one but she's only going to ever have to put the minimum in from from earnings and she's going to have a nice really nice stash of cash at 65 so that's why we did it. Yeah and I do think it really comes down to horses for courses right mm -hmm. um, where I do think KiwiSaver is incredible mostly between 18 to 65 because most of the perks that are set up for it are made for salaried employees um so if you're under 18 even if you have you know one of those teenage part-time jobs your boss does not have to do the employer match which i think sucks um teenage workers work just as hard in fact actually i worked harder in my teenage jobs i would say i worked in a cafe and that was extremely hard work um but yeah so they don't get that employer match um they don't get the um government tax break of the 500 dollars a year um so those sweeteners that i think make KiwiSaver so worthwhile um and so worth locking your money away they don't exist for the under 18s so that kind of sucks um so i think after that it becomes you know, thinking about your kid and what options are you trying to give them with this? You know, if you think that your kid is a bit airy fairy and more likely to blow it and you really, really want to make sure that they can't blow it, that they can only have it for retirement or for a house deposit, then, you know, maybe you would set them up for KiwiSaver. But, you know, you don't have those sweeteners that make locking the money away worthwhile and you can get a lot of those same benefits of investing the money and growing it you can get that through investing it yourself um, and you can get all the same good growth, but they could start a business with it or go traveling with it. I, I think that traveling when you're 18, I mean, I would hope they wouldn't blow the whole nest egg, but it's still a really great thing that can broaden their minds and be really important. So I do think, yeah, horses for courses, but for my money, I think the flexibility of investing outside KiwiSaver when under 18, probably for most people. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. Um, so let's wrap up there. Um, if you have any other questions about kids accounts that we couldn't get to tonight, feel free to reach out to our lovely investor care team at help at shares.co.nz. 
And thank you so much to Ruth, Francis, and Alicia for joining us tonight and to all of you for tuning in. We covered some really great uh, subjects and concepts talking about diversification and making sure that we're taking long-term approaches and it's time in the market and not time in the market um, and the you know huge power of uh, compound returns. Um, and just a reminder, if you are interested in creating a Shares These Kids account, you can use the promo code KIDS22 to get a $10 kickstart to the wallet. Thank you, everyone. Ka kite. Ka kite. Thank you. Thank you.